Um, I'll start with you, Stephen Kinnock. As a party, you're not impressed with this um, autumn statement. So what would you reverse if you win the election? Who knows when it is? This autumn statement has lifted the lid on 13 years of Tory economic failure. Uh, we see low growth, high taxes, high mortgages, high prices. We've seen, of course, the kamikaze budget by Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng, and working people are still paying the price for that. What we need to do to reverse that is to get growth moving in our country. As was rightly pointed out, we're now seeing growth figures revised down. We've got the lowest growth forecast in the entire yeah, but G7. On the specifics, on national insurance, for example, would you reverse that? It's gone down from 12% to 10 Would you put that back up? Well, I, I'm sure you would love for me to set out our entire manifesto uh, on this programme. I'm not in a position to do that. What we do need to see is a tax base which is which reflects the interests and needs of working people. We need to see growth in our economy. We need to see investment in our public services. Seven, eight, seven point eight million people right. on our uh, UK so we'll NHS waiting wait, list. Wait to public see. services okay. crumbling. That requires investment. Ben Lake, national insurance down. Benefits up by by the maximum that was the choice. You know, state pension up eight point five percent. Living wage up. Uh, we've heard from the people of Ebu Vale. It, is this good for Wales? There's something good for Wales in there, isn't there? Well, you'll take whatever they're willing to give you, obviously. But at the end of the day, there were two choices here. We talk about national insurance. I would have far preferred the Chancellor move the thresholds, for example, in line with inflation. That would have been far more beneficial to families on the lowest incomes. Because the fact of the matter is that as significant as the two pence cut is, it gives about 10 billion back into the pockets of people. But the decision to freeze the rates, the thresholds, has taken 40 billion out. So, of course, it's better than nothing, but it's not great. I, and I asked the Secretary of State for the, about that, Stephen Crabb, in, this, in the interest of transparency. You know, the IFS is saying that because of the thresholds being frozen, it's wiped out. Any decrease in national insurance is just wiped out. Well, I don't think anybody's been shying away from the fact today that recognising that we have increased the tax burden over the last three or four years. And why have we increased the tax burden? Because the UK government was asked to get the country through the COVID pandemic, paying for people to stay safe, stay at home. Uh, we've got the country through a cost of living crisis with support, paying people's energy bill. All of that's cost hundreds of billions. And at no point in the last three years have either Stephen Kinnock or Ben Lake stood up in the House of Commons to say, whoa, we're spending too much money, let's be careful about how much tax this is going to cause. So it's a bit rich now to hear them both say, well, but, hang on, we've got but, taxes that are too high. You know, I mean, Stephen... But the neglect and incompetence and failure predates the COVID pandemic. I mean, we're looking at years and years of failure. The, the NHS waiting list was already going through the roof okay. before so COVID. Your, your, your constituency... So, you know, it's, your this is a long-term set of failures. Your constituency, like mine in Pembrokeshire, like Keredigian in West Wales, all of our constituencies, and right across Wales, there's been a culture of low pay. Today, we're increasing the minimum wage to £11.44 per hour. And on that, that, is, that, that's Steve, on that Stephen Crabb, that, yeah. that is welcome, I'm sure, from so many workers. But you've got to acknowledge that for some very small businesses, that's a big, hefty pay wage rise, isn't it? I mean, they, you know, their wage bill is going up. Well, you, and you, it's not the government putting that bill. It's small businesses. I mean, you, the, you, yeah, you cover the bill for the private sec public sector, five billion, but the private sector have to deliver it too. Little businesses and, in And that was always the argument against having a, a minimum wage to start with. And, the, and the, the argument that was made was actually, no, explaining to small businesses in Wales, if you do increase the minimum wage, and yes, you're going to have to pay it, actually that helps your local economy because the money stays circulating in the local economy. It's a good way to, to, to boost the, the whole local... Okay. Ben Lake, benefits. Um, now... It's a good thing they're going up by 6.7%, is it? And I is that so. what you would do? Of course, yes. I mean, I think it's right to, uh, to increase the benefits in line with inflation. I think that's the right thing to do. Um, I don't think there's an argument against that, actually. Um, that was one of the few things that I think I'd welcome in today's budget. Right, so there is something. Uh, um, Stephen Kinnock, is, it, are you concerned at all about this idea of the fit-to-work new rule? You know, that some people could lose their benefits if they can't prove that they're out there trying for jobs and if there are jobs for them, they don't take them. It is absolutely right that if people can work, uh, they should work. But we've also got to have fairness in the system. We've got to make work pay. And as has already been pointed out, with the fiscal drag that we're seeing, so many working people now are being dragged into the highest tax. But this, was, this is going to be the highest taxing parliament since the Second World War. We are looking at people whose personal finances are going into meltdown. Inflation going through the roof. Mortgages going through the roof. 
energy bills going through the roof. I just felt that today was almost a sleepwalking okay. autumn statement, uh, which failed to completely fail to recognise the gravity of the situation uh, that and we're Stephen in. And Stephen Crabbe, you were Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. I mean, what's the implication here with this fit to work rule? Is it that people in Wales are playing the system? Are there people in Wales playing the system? Well, I, I, that's not for me to judge. What we have got, and we know this, is 7 million people across the UK who are not making themselves available for work, and that doesn't include students. And by the way, Wales has a higher than average share of those people not making themselves available to work. Meanwhile, we've all got businesses in our constituencies screaming out for people to apply for jobs that are available today. So, so I, there are I, so, people so, no, should, so It's about giving people the right support and incentives so that they can go back to the workplace. And that's why we're increasing the minimum wage. It's why we're increasing, uh, decreasing the national insurance rates and changing the equation to make sure it always pays to go yeah. out to work. What about Sue's point there in the pantry in Ebu Vale, uh, Ben Lake? You know, p politicians like you, you know the problem, but you don't understand it, uh, which is a very strong and powerful point. You know, you try and live on £40 a week. She's got a point, hasn't she? I'm not sure she does, actually, um, because this is something that all MPs will have a lot of sympathy for, is that our uh, caseloads, our caseworkers, every Friday we're out there talking to people who are in desperate situations, who are in need of dire help, and we go out there on a limb to try and help them. We know but how hard it is for them to find support in the current climate. But you don't live We've... it, do you? You, you <laughs> no, listen, you don't live but it. you don't live it, we don't and that's live the it. point. But no, your point was, do you understand it? And yes, I think we can understand it. Uh, we're not living well, through it. Well, she's making no, the, the distinction point. between knowing and understanding, you know. Well, I think in this regard, when you have a situation where we've all probably had a caseload that's increased significantly in recent years, where we're helping our caseworkers are working night and day, I should add, as well, to try and support people. This point, I, I, I have to say, is rather a lazy one, that politicians don't live in the real world. If only we weren't, because at the moment it's a very difficult world out there, and so we do appreciate just how difficult it is for our constituents. And that's why we're here. Yes, we have different ideas as how to make it better for them, but we're there. We're making the case in Parliament to try and improve things and to help people through this cost of living crisis. OK, well, thank you very much. Uh, for now, we'll talk specifically about uh, measures for Wales very shortly. Have you heard it there? It's, it's not enough for Wales. What a really negative interview from a Welsh Government Finance Minister. Now, she's got complete freedom to design a budget for Wales. UK Government doesn't tell Welsh Government how to spend its money. It gives them complete freedom. And here she is standing here saying, well, we can't do this, we can't do this, because uh, we're waiting for Welsh Government, for UK Government to give us more. I just think this is one of the things that really holds well Wales back, is this kind of negativity this pessimism, pessimism, always looking to blame UK government and somebody okay. else rather than taking flip, responsibility flip into her for shoes. the budget that she has okay. got. Very briefly, for. walk in her shoes, right? And somebody gives you three hundred and five million to spend over the next two years. Mm -hmm. Would you be jumping for joy? Well, I'd, I'd welcome that as an increase. But what you could, wouldn't hear her say is that she welcomed any of the measures today. She would say that UK government, are, and UK and Welsh government are working together. But she wouldn't say that she welcomes those measures, even though some of her Labour colleagues in those Valleys councils did. I, mean, I just thought it was incredibly disappointing and negative. Are you more upbeat, uh, Stephen Kinnock, or do you agree with your colleague? I thought that Rebecca set the case out very clearly, which is there's an overall 1% cut in real terms to uh, the budget for Wales. And what we also need to bear in mind is that the cost of living crisis doesn't respect borders. The fiscal drag, the huge impact of inflation, uh, the, the crumbling public services that we're facing, these are issues which cut across uh, the entire United what Kingdom. What about the free so ports? Our, uh, you know, free ports, enterprise zones, you know, the Welsh Government is maybe not driving these as much as the UK Government, is that fair? Uh, no, well, actually, Stephen and I have both been very active in supporting the Celtic Freeport. I'm very excited about the floating offshore wind opportunities. What we need is a UK government and a Welsh government working uh, hand in glove to make these things happen. That's why we need a UK Labour government, because it is quite clear that the Conservative government in the UK is not really on the side of Wales. The business rates I asked Rebecca Evans about, um, you know, should the Welsh government replicate that in December? I think they should. 
Um, no, I've been contacted by a number of small businesses who have said just how difficult it is for them at the moment. Uh, and that's the case across Wales, rural and urban areas. Um, and I think one of the things they have uh, been quite clear about is that the relief that they did receive, uh, especially the 75% for the hospitality, leisure and retail, um, was a real godsend. And they did want uh, very clearly for that to be uh, extended into next year. So I do hope the Welsh Government does replicate that and extend it for another year. Yeah, and, and Stephen Kinnock, the other... Um tax change for businesses is this full expensing, isn't it? If you invest in machinery, uh, then you, you every pound you spend, you get to 25 pence back on your tax bill. Um, now, that is to be welcomed, isn't it? it? It is to be welcomed. But one thing we know about business is that it needs, above all else, certainty, stability. And what we have seen is a carousel of chaos. Uh, we've on to our seventh chancellor since 2010. We had the catastrophic impact of the Liz Trust quasi Quateng budget. And we've had so many different ministers and uh, prime ministers coming through that business doesn't really know where to put that investment. They need long-term certainty. Certainly anything which stimulates investment in plant and machinery and in uh, boosting productivity is hugely welcome. But fundamentally, are we going to get the long-term commitment from business? Private sector investment in the UK is falling off a cliff. Stephen Crabb, uh, we've talked a lot about HS2. It's a train now going from London to Birmingham. Can you explain to your electors in Pembrokeshire how that is a Wales and England project and that Wales therefore doesn't get the billion pounds it would have got? Um, well, no, I can't. And the, chair, the committee that I chair, the Welsh Affairs Committee, we, we came to a very clear conclusion on this and Ben sits on that committee and we wanted the UK government to look again at the way they classify that mm. project because we felt that it doesn't give sufficient benefit So they're to wrong. It should have been in the budget today. That would have been a billion pounds for Wales. Well, I'm all in favour of seeing more investment into Welsh railways. You know, we, we've got some terrible transport for Wales. Do you think you could have got it if you were Secretary of State? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm but not you'd have fought for it. David T.C. Davis is doing a very good job as Secretary of State for Wales. It's one argument that we, as Welsh MPs, backbenchers, haven't one yet with the government. But you're going to keep fighting? But we still make the case, yeah. OK. Um, electioneering. This was one for an election, wasn't it? I mean, when, I mean is he ready? To, is he opening the door on a, on a May election here? Well, there has to be an election at some point in the next 12 months or so, so it's no mystery that there is an election coming down the tracks fast at us. Um, Are you preparing? Um, lots of, there's, lots of, there's lots of activity going on across the parties in Wales, which suggests that they are all... Increasing. Have you decided if you're standing, by the way? Well, that's not an issue for tonight. We're talking about the autumn statement. OK, <laughs> still waiting. OK, when's it going to be? And wasn't it a sign that maybe it could be in May? I think it was quite interesting that the national insurance cut, you know, the two-pence cut, uh, will come into force in January, which I think, yeah, it's fair to say it probably opens the door for a May election. Does it? Um... I wish there was an election tomorrow. We desperately <laughs> need to get rid of this awful Conservative government that is just letting the country down all uh, in, in so many of the ways we've discussed this evening. So bring it on, is what I say. Really? You, you're all ready. You're all ready when it is a, But you're having a think about it. Do you okay. think ready okay. for an we have to leave it there. 100%. <laughs> to be continued. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, for